Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Thus far the reading of God's word this evening. Now that the subject of our message tonight, of our study, is a contrast between two characteristics. One is passion, being passionate, and the other is patience, passion and patience. I can say quite readily to you tonight, without having to think about it too much, that when it comes to the subject of patience, I am, admittedly, quite an expert. (laughs) Why do I say that I am an expert at patience? And that is because I see people every day exercising a great deal of patience with me. So I have a lot of experience in observing how it is to be done and how it is to be characteristic in the Christian life. And you all are growing better because you're more patient with me. I think the first thing we need to know here is that patience is a commonly appreciated trait in the world. It's not just Christians that can appreciate patience. Patience throughout history has been something held up as a virtue. The well-known phrase, patience is a virtue, is not found in Scripture. And it does go back farther than Ben Franklin. The original quotation, patience is the greatest of all virtues, is credited to the Roman statesman Cato the Elder, who lived from 234 to 149 B.C., And since his time, many in the world have affirmed the virtue of patience in their own testimonies. Our patience, Edmund Burke once said, will achieve more than our force. If I ever have made any valuable discoveries, Sir Isaac Newton once reflected, it has been owing more to patient attention than to any other talent. And an old Dutch proverb says a handful of patience is worth more than a bushel full of brains. And yet for all of that, patience is not always regarded positively, is it? In fact, in today's society, it would seem we give much more praise and much more glory to the one who will not be restrained by patience or anything else. Carpe diem, seize the day. If one is patient, he's regarded as weak. He's regarded as lazy. He's regarded as cowardly. While the one who jumps in so as to get things done is heralded as the man or the woman of action. James has already addressed this in his letter. Nothing is more important in our world than those two worldly priorities of now and self. The problem with patience, as it turns out, is that patience is something we always want in other people. We want them to be patient with us, but too often it is not a trait we feel the need to exercise. Commonly, we are convinced that patience with someone else is grace. We feel we are giving that person something he really doesn't deserve. I'm being patient with you. 
As another writer puts it, you must first have a lot of patience to learn to be patient. Now that brings up a real point here. Patience is not really seen in the world's eye as a virtue, a quality of character anymore, that young people particularly look to and admire in other people. Patience is just seen instead as a tool. You act patiently with someone else for a time with all the red tape and all the details and all of the hassles that it requires because by being patient, you get something. And the goal is big enough that you are forced to wait. Otherwise, who has any use for patience? No one. We're out of here. Now, even though patience is a trait that the world knows and sometimes practices, the Christian's patience needs to be understood that it is something different. It is not just a discipline. It is a gift. For one thing, this patience is a gift of God's Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 lists the characteristics of The fruit of the Spirit, which come to us by way of conversion, by way of sanctification. First is love, joy, peace, and then comes patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and finally, self-control. This kind of patience is not exercised for selfish motives. It is something given to someone else out of the love that God has given to us. Two things Paul teaches here. Or I'm, uh, James, I guess I said. Two things Paul, uh, James teaches here. The, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, he, I'm referring back to Galatians. Two things in Galatians Paul is teaching us. Number one, the fruit of the Spirit's presence calls us away from the way the world thinks and the motives it uses, even when, it ex- when people exercise patience, calls us away from the works of the flesh. And it calls us then toward Christ-likeness. Christ doesn't want you to be patient in order to get something. He doesn't want you to be patient for a selfish motive. He wants you to be patient as a giving it to someone else as a gift because he wants you to be called toward a Christ-likeness. Well, the presence of the Holy Spirit does not mean that we become immediate experts at being loving and joyful and patient, etc. It does mean that God gives to us both the will and the ability to exercise those gifts. And when we understand those two things, We also recognize the reason why it's important to practice these new things. Because by them, we not only grow ourselves, we also strengthen one another. Both of those things are important. When we exercise the the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we are not only growing ourselves, we are strengthening one another. It's another reason for corporate worship, another reason for gathering with the saints. Uh, Too many people think that going to church is just about what I can get out of the sermon. But But the real work of the Spirit is to minister to one another. And we wish to grow and we wish to strengthen one another. Christian patience is not a trait we must force ourselves to display. That's another thing we need to learn. We don't have to force ourselves to show Christian patience. We've all seen comedy routines on television where an actor plays someone who is trying to keep himself under control but eventually blows up because he is incapable any longer of restraining his impatience. The patience God calls us to have in the Holy Spirit does go against our fallen nature. 
That's part of what it means to repent of impatience, to repent of our selfish drives and our hunger to get something now, to strengthen ourselves and to think of ministering to the other. And now it is a blessing of patience that we truly want to exercise toward others. It is for our benefit and it is for their benefit. The patience that God gives us, or gifts us with, rather, allows us to live with a different goal in mind. That's what he's talking about in verse 7 and 8. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. We are living now for the coming of the Lord. Now, ultimately, we are patient in order to please Jesus and not ourselves. There's another difference. When we exercise the gift of patience, we are wanting to please Jesus, to love, delight our Savior. We live today in anticipation of his return. That's what Psalm 96 taught us. We live in anticipation of his reward. In other words, not only is he the source of our patience, not only is he the character of our patience, Jesus is the goal of our patience. That is something the unbeliever, of course, can't, can't understand, can't comprehend that. Nor does he appreciate it or want to share it. But that which means nothing to him is worth everything to the Christian. That's the second thing to know. Patience for the Christian is truly an exercise of faith. You are living your faith when you are giving that strengthening patience to others. As James encourages his people in verse 7, the farmer must Learn to be patient. He's faithfully planted his seed. He trusts God for the rain that will bring life, but then he must let time pass. Knowing, believing, trusting that waiting while he looks at that barren field, that he is properly focusing his time and energy and not wasting it away. So also the believer has planted his seed, vested his faith, and now he must live his life trusting God for his promises that what he waits for will come to pass. It is trusting in the reward to come that keeps the farmer from ruining and abandoning his crops prematurely. I haven't seen any growth in the last day. I'm gone. I'm not waiting long anymore. And it keeps the Christian from forsaking his Lord and letting his eyes drift to the things of the world. He waits for what he will receive at the last. <coughs> John Bunyan wrote about this in The Pilgrim's Progress. Christian, early in his walk, visits the interpreter's house. And there in the interpreter's house, Christian is taught a lesson about two children. Two children, one is named Patience and the other is named Passion. Passion, uh, passion and Patience are uh, in a room with all kinds of toys and delights spread out before them. Passion sees the delights of this world and sees no reason not to jump in and enjoy them right away. Instead, he uh, he seizes what he can now. He laughs at patience because to all appearances, patience is losing out. But very soon, passion has emptied his treasures. He has broken his toys. He has worn out all of the things that are there, and he is done, and he is empty. Patience, on the other hand, receives his things later. Not only are they better, 
His rewards are things that do not wear out. And the lesson there is so very important. Patience, uh, I mean, Bunyan's lesson there is very effective. He who goes first, people of the world, chasing after things of the world, thing, see he goes first, must give place to him who goes last. You might teach that to your kids when they line up in line. Everybody wants to be first. Somebody's got to be last. First place must give way to last. Last must have its time, but last gives place to no one, Bunyan says, for there is not another to follow after him. He, has, he, he that has his first must have his time, but he that has his last has it lastingly. Now, in verses 8 through 11, James gives us some illustrations to teach us how to live with spiritual patience in this life. First, he says, trust in and wait for that goal of Christian patience to come. If you have ever grown a garden, you can understand this. No one enjoys fruit that's picked too early. I grow grapes and blueberries and now blackberries in my backyard and you don't want to eat them when they're green. I take my word for it. You know that the ripening is coming, but you have to wait for that. You must be patient and you must wait for its appearing. If you, if you know gardening, but you do not know the promises of God, then I invite you to read of them in the scriptures. Come and put your trust in the one who will reward you at the last. Second, he says, he, he says establish your hearts in the meantime. This means to ground, ground and strengthen your will so that you become stronger through the practice of self-restraint and of building others up. Rather than become weaker through impatience and through selfishness as time passes and as the temptations grow. Be faithful in your devotions. Be faithful in your prayer time. Let your relationship with Christ deepen with a sense of hope. Let it strengthen your resolve. And be an encouragement to other Christians. Point them again and again to the goal to come and bless them in their own struggles and their own temptations. Third, see and control your own selfish emotions. One thing we can know for sure Emotions you feel today will mightily try to pull you in different directions. But how you feel must not be allowed to distract you from the long-term goal you have put before you. What good is an expression of temper now if it only weakens your overall character tomorrow? What good is an expression of temper now if by giving yourself to it you only become more impatient? What purpose does lust have now if by it you only become more hungry, more greedy for the people and things in your life? Not to, not to love them, not to care for them, but just to use them until they're all used up, until they're broken. What purpose does lust have now if all you gain through it is a stronger hunger for the things of the world and less desire for God? How will letting your insecurities determine for you the course you will go in order to find some shelter, some comfort in some other person or in some other thing. When in truth, that insecurity really needs to be confessed to God and patiently put to rest by loving and trusting in Him more and more. When you don't feel like waiting on anything or anybody, learn what it means to wait on the Lord. 
Fourth, endure what must be endured. Christ has not given you a spirit of patience because life is easy or because you have no opposition. He has given you what you need now so that you will be able to stand up under those things and when all else is done, to stand, even if you have to stand alone for a while. And then fifth, recall often what you know to be true. Look around you at the older Christians in your church. Make a point to ask that older Christian about his life, about her life. Let them tell you a story that you've never heard before about how the Lord has been faithful to them over these many years, about how he has seen them through much and has always been there for them, how the Lord has been patient with them again and again and again and again. You might think you know these older people in the church. Yeah, that's Mrs. So-and-so. This is Mr. What's-His-Name. They've been a part of your church for years. Of course you know them. They're so familiar you don't, have to, you don't have to question. But unless you hear their testimony, you don't know where they have been. You don't know what they've seen. You don't know what they have worked through in their lives. You don't know what you might learn for your own strengthening from them. Above that, read the stories in the Bible. James brings up Job here, which, of course, is always a very challenging book to read. But, at, but reading Job can be very strengthening at times when you feel attacked or opposed. What kept Job going? What's that again? What kept Job faithful? Well, it says in chapter 19, Job is crying out, he has walled up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness upon my paths. He has stripped from me my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone, and my hope has been pulled up like a tree. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in a rock forever, for I want to prosecute God, is what I'm saying. I want an excuse. I want an answer, Lord, for what you've done. But that's not what he says. He stops. It's like Psalm 73. He enters into the worship of God, and all of a sudden he trembles like Psalm 96 tells us to do. And what does he say? For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth and after my skin has been dis thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. What that must have meant to James, who was watching Jerusalem come apart all around him, who was seeing his own congregation waver under the seductive ravages of temptation and under the pressure and intimidation of rising persecution, who faced growing attacks by fellow Jews pointing angrily in his direction. What it must have meant for James to read Job and to believe as Job believed. The standard Christian joke is don't pray for patience, you just might get it. The myth there is that patience is not something I really want. That patience is only learned by adversity and pain. And I only learn that if I'm forced to. But Christian patience is a gift. It's a gift from the Holy Spirit. And it is meant to be practiced and given away to others in the sunshine as well as in the storm. And the more real your hope for glory becomes to you, the more you will find that patience 
to be your friend and not your taskmaster. Let's pray together. Lord, this is another demonstration of how the gospel is not works righteousness. You do not call upon us to be patient in our own strength so that we may satisfy you in some way. You've even given us a gift to strengthen ourselves and to encourage one another. May we be known as a congregation that exercises that gift. May we be blessed. Even if our world crashes down around our shoulders like it did for James, may our thoughts be to Job. May we realize, Lord, that when we have patience with other people and we wait for you, we are not wasting our time. We thank you for the glory of your holy coming, and we wait for it in Jesus' name. Amen.